This is episode 41 of the Construction Leading Edge podcast over at ConstructionLeadingEdge.com. My name is Todd DeWalt, and my job here is to help you grow your leadership skills, grow your business, and grow your income. Today we have an interview with Ken Stowe. He has been in the construction business for about 25 years. He's worked for Disney Imagineering. Uh, a few other large general contractors around the country, and now he works with AEC firms across the globe, helping them to transition to and leverage the power of BIM, Building Information Modeling. In this interview, we talk about topics including how to accelerate your schedule by 7 to 12 percent, uh, how to introduce prefabrication into your projects to speed them up and make you more money, We talk about a unique approach to bidding projects by modeling them ahead of time. Uh, We uh, talk about some of the things that Ken learned while working at Disney, and we also talk about how to eliminate waste. A lot about how to eliminate waste. That's something that Ken is very passionate about. But first, I've got a question for you. What's one of the largest productivity killers in the construction industry and on your construction projects that is reducible, yet you are probably not doing anything about well, it's not, we're not talking about the skilled labor shortage. We're not talking about change orders. We're not talking about owners that don't pay. And I'm not talking about millennials using their smartphones on the job. What I'm talking about is unresolved conflict, either unresolved conflict conflict between two people that work together, perhaps between a manager and a direct report, between a general contractor and a subcontractor, et cetera. Unresolved conflict in my experience and based on my research, is one of the largest reducible productivity costs that nobody's looking at. So early in my career, I worked with this old project manager. His name was Daryl. And Daryl didn't exactly have the best conflict resolution skills. You might even say he didn't have any conflict resolution skills. He bragged about firing every carpenter in the union hall on one project back in the day. And I happened to work with uh, Daryl on a project. We were renovating the lobbies of a high-rise office building. And uh, for some reason, Daryl got sideways with the drywall superintendent on this job. It even got to the point where Daryl would say things like, quote, I hate those guys. I want to screw them over every chance I get, end quote. Not good. Not good for the project. Not good for the sub. It wasn't even good for Daryl. Uh, made my life harder in a lot of cases. So you could say that my friend Daryl made a lot of mistakes when it came to dealing with conflict on this job. Now, I've seen a lot of mistakes when handling conflict on the job site. Perhaps you have made mistakes just like me when it came to dealing with conflict. In fact, uh, I've made a lot of mistakes, um, lots and lots of mistakes. I've learned a lot of things the hard way. So there's a lot of research that says that unresolved conflict is a huge problem in business today. There's a guy named Daniel Dana who actually wrote a book on conflict resolution. And uh, he's the one that said that unresolved interpersonal conflict is one of the largest reducible productivity costs that nobody's looking at. And beyond business, we're also talking about marriages and families as well that are impacted negatively by unresolved conflict. So here's what I've done. I put together a list of 41 mistakes you need to avoid when dealing with conflict. 41 mistakes to avoid when dealing with conflict. I want to get this in your hands. Let me give you a couple of uh, examples. Item number, or uh, mistake number three on the list is avoiding conflict. This is one that I've been guilty of in the past. Here's some interesting statistics. A recent survey found that 35% of managers, get this, 35% of managers would rather jump out of a plane than deal with conflict. 27% would rather shave their head for charity than deal with conflict. And I don't know where this question came from, but 8% of them, of these managers, would rather eat bugs than deal with conflict. So mistake number three is avoiding conflict. Mistake number 19 is when dealing with conflict, using generalizations. In other words, saying things like, you're always late, you're always causing problems, you're always messing up, etc. You never show up on time. Everybody says they don't like working with you. Generalizing, using words like always, never, everybody, etc. Don't be vague. Don't generalize. You need to be very specific. So mistake number 19 is generaliz- generalizing. Generalizing. Mistake number 19A might be mispronouncing generalizing. Um, mistake number 20 is not having a plan. Just 
not having any plan at all or any strategy when it comes to dealing with conflict. See, when we're caught off guard, we're more likely to fall back into the old, ineffective bad habits like uh, one I talked about previously, the combat mentality or generalizing or just avoiding the conflict altogether. The key that I found to effective confrontation or conflict resolution is to have a plan going into it for how this tough conversation needs to go. And that takes a lot of the emotion out of it and takes the, the chance and the, the variables out of the equation. So you need to get your hands on this list of 41 mistakes when it comes to dealing with conflict resolution. And you need to look at it and then figure out the ones you're guilty of. Um, I want to get this in your hands. You could go to uh, www.constructionleadingedge.com forward slash mistakes. Stick your email and address in there and I'll send it to you. Uh, you'll get a PDF that you can download. I keep a copy of it handy um, so I can re refer to it whenever I have an issue. So 41 mistakes to avoid when dealing with conflict. ConstructionLeadingEdge.com forward slash mistakes, and I'll send it to you. Now, without further ado, let's get to the interview with Mr. Ken Stowe. Enjoy. All right. Ken, thanks for being on the podcast today. How are you today, sir? I'm great. Thanks, Todd. Excellent. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, so let's just jump right into it. You've been in the construction business a long time. Uh, you spent 25 years in the construction industry, actually, on the operations side. You've since moved into software, and we're going to talk about your career and experience in a little bit. But let's start with this. What are some of the biggest challenges that you see construction executives and business owners facing today? Well, I think it's a really difficult job right now. There's so many things in flux. There's there's new contract arrangements like uh, CM at risk with pre-construction services. There's design build. There's IPD, integrated project delivery, and P3s, design build operate. And so if you blend that with the notion that um, – You've got young people coming in with a lot of exposure to technology, and and a lot of people haven't got that exposure. The tech, introducing technology into a, a culture is is difficult. And then you've got um, the story about lean construction. Uh, some of the research indicating that there's a lot of waste, and we know where some of it comes from, but there's uh, I think a big question in executives' minds is how much are we going to put, uh, how much effort are we going to put into uh, re-engineering our culture and our processes to honor lean principles? So those are just some of the things that make it a complex assignment right now. So let's talk about waste. Um and lean specifically, there's probably some folks listening who are thinking, you know, I, I'm barely keeping my head above water as it is. I really don't have time to go learn another system um, or another way of doing business. Why should I? What's in it for me? What's 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 in lean for me? You mentioned waste. How much waste on average is the, the typical construction project experiencing? therefore impacting the bottom line for that construction business owner who's skeptical? Well, back when I was still in construction, uh, Burati uh, wrote an article that says it's, a, it's right around 12%. 12% of the contract um, is uh, waste, and 79% of those problems that are, actually originate in the design phase, which agrees with my assessment in 25 years, I'd never met a project manager or a superintendent that was ever happy with design. There were errors and omissions and what the Koreans call illogical design. Um, Chelson, Douglas Chelson, when he did his PhD study, uh, he did a survey of a lot of different academic sources, and uh, his paper indicates that most of those sources estimate uh, rework in 2010 to be between 4% and 14% of the direct cost. So it's still a big problem, and Lean is just trying to get um, get more value out of every dollar and every uh, productive hour of people's time 
uh, just more on value-added activities instead of um, rework. All right, so the typical general contractor is fighting to get a 5% fee, probably more like 3% on a building project at least. So you're saying typical project experiences 4 to 14% rework. So you, know, you don't have to be a mathematical genius to figure out that if you're, you're scraping to get a 3% fee and you're dealing with a lot of rework, then lean will impact the bottom line. That's, that's what I'm hearing you say. Is that right? That's my recommendation is to take a look at where the rework is, all the change orders that we do, and then begin to look at the root cause of those uh, elements of rework. And my assertion is um, we're still seeing the root cause of most of our rework is in design, errors and omissions, and illogical design. All right, so let's talk about that a little bit. What what can a contractor do? Let's say they're in a typical design, bid, build contract. Maybe even it's a competitively bid contract. What can they do to to mitigate those design errors and omissions? Well, one of the things that's uh, still quite rare, I think, but it's it's definitely a possibility, is that um, in place of pouring over construction documents and getting the quantities that you need to feed into your cost estimate, actually model the project um, with a, a model-based tool and identify errors and omissions and identify opportunities. Sometimes you can get uh, rewarded by the owner if you come up with a better idea, but certainly you won't get caught um, with the wrong price because the um, problems are, that are built into the design are either going to lead to losses or they're going to lead into uh, enormous change orders that are really hard to collect on. Yeah, that's... Um, I want to talk about your hypothesis on modeling during the bidding process, but you, you bring up a good point, and I can hear I can hear some of the the contractors in the background thinking changes. Well, changes are good for me. You know, I get fifteen percent or twenty percent, or I get a higher margin on changes than I do on um, on my original contract. So, what I'm hearing, I hear people saying, you know, changes are actually good for me, but what um, what I've found is that in a lot of cases, changes just cause delays. And yeah, you might get 15% on that uh, additional work, but what you're not taking into account is the opportunity cost and the lost production, and the you've lost the opportunity to take your resources, being your people, equipment, technology, et cetera, onto the next project to make profit somewhere else when you're, you're bogged down in, in changes. Are there... Are there other, what else would you say to that, that guy or gal out there who's saying, I make money on change orders? Well, if changes are good, um, they're certainly not good for your owner, and there may be an opportunity to build a relationship with an owner and identify changes and fix them before they turn into colossal um, costs that you may or may not get paid for, and you may get paid um, many months after you actually have to execute them. Um, the other thing that I would say is that when you have, if you can identify change, changes really uh, early in the process, before bid if possible, so that you go into the bidding process with your eyes wide open, it really behooves you in many ways to find those errors and omissions as soon as possible. And so, and that's what happens in the process of modeling. You, you stumble onto these um, problems in the design, and now you are thinking strategically rather than uh, reactively. Okay, so you're a proponent of using BIM to model a project during the bidding process. So for those that aren't familiar with BIM, can you give a, a couple of minute explanation of, of what that First of all, what the acronym stands for and, and really what it is. Yeah, well, let me just first of all say I'm a proponent of, of doing it as early as possible. And so um, 
the first thing I recommend is um, whatever you can get from the design team through the owner or otherwise electronically, um, you get as soon as possible. Uh, you, you can explain it that it makes you a more productive, more effective, more accurate um, a player in the bidding process. Uh, you may be able to build a relationship uh, because the owner is the one that suffers the most. The owner suffers about 65% of, of all the waste the owner pays for. Um, but beyond that, just building it as soon as possible so that the, a really um, an effective modeling process will turn the two-dimensional output into model um, after the fact or if it's a design build, you can do it um, before you create your two-dimensional output. You'll still have the same prints. Um, they'll just be more accurate. You will have found those problems. So the model is made up of objects like culverts and light fixtures and uh, pavement, um, buildings, foundations, retaining walls, and so on. And so you kind of drag and drop these into your um, your design model, and they're rich with information. It can be made very powerful for the estimator, for the um, contracting, for the execution, for the layout and control, and for the operations and maintenance of whatever you're building. If it's a water treatment plant, the equipment that's in there has rich information about its properties, its weight, its power requirements, and so on. Okay, so do you have a, can you share maybe an example of an issue that could be caught during the bidding phase? Let's say the a contractor's bidding on a new construction project and uh, they, they get the model from the owner, from the architect. What What's an example of an issue that they could catch by creating a model during the bidding process, and then what's the result of that? Well, on the infrastructure, the civil side, there are a lot of examples where contractors were able to identify at an intersection with tons of pipe that are going to be um, uh, running through the intersection at different angles, at different elevations. They detect, detect a, um, a clash. The same thing can be said for in a hospital above the ceiling, uh, but they detect that there's a, a error and there's a clash, and the software helps you um, identify those clashes and and get the elevations changed or get the fix from design before you're out there with a the backhoe and you just uh, everybody's waiting for an answer to come back. What what are we going to do now? That's just yeah, a classic exactly. example. Yeah. There are other examples where um, gas lines have been hit, water lines have been hit. Of course, that's sometimes just because the as-built documentation is so poor. But getting getting the existing uh, modeled up and the, the new design modeled in uh, it can really eliminate some of those classic collisions. No, that makes perfect sense, and that's really where the, even though, let, let's say, on the, say you're doing a utility project and you have an intersection, and I've been in this situation where you have uh, gas, water, fiber, electric, all intersecting, and they all want to be at the same place, and storm, storm sewer, sanitary sewer, et cetera, you've got five or six different flavors of utilities all coming through. You bid on the project. There's no way you know what where they're all at in, by just looking at, at them on paper. And you get to that situation, and then there's a, a conflict, and you have to wait for an answer from the engineer. Uh, maybe you're working on a unit price contract, and you don't get paid to wait. You have 500 to a thousand dollars an hour worth of equipment sitting out there stalled while this issue tries to get sorted out. When if it were modeled in advance, the issue could be sorted out while they're either lines on paper or digitally, and nobody nobody would ever know that the, nobody would ever know there was a problem. It would it would all be engineered properly. So, yeah, I, I can see some hu huge benefits there. Um, you used an interesting term. You said in your career you spent a lot of time um, using uh, 
the well responding to design problems or challenges on projects using what you call brute force. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, I, there's no there's no surprise that we would put in tons of overtime, and a lot of times the overtime would be in response to some delay that we had, was which as a result of errors and omissions, we were waiting for some kind of an answer. Uh, so we put in a lot of overtime. We used to get rewarded for overtime. You know, the people who got the bonuses were the ones that were willing to work late. Um, but um, the best executives I ever ran into were always saying, can we work smarter, not harder? Um, uh, brute force, I, I think, it also was, would show up in the meetings that we have. We'd have team uh, project meetings, and they'd be yelling and finger pointing because we we were we were suffering from the delays that came from uh, errors and omissions, requests for information, change order approval, and and we were suffering financially, and we would end up in court on the really bad projects and it would take sometimes years to get our final payment. Yeah. So one of the um so obviously there's a there's gotta be a change in behavior and what I found is that one of the the toughest barriers to overcome when changing behavior would be the what what I would call limiting beliefs or kind of the things that you believe to be facts that may not be facts. For example, somebody might have the, the belief that the only way to solve a problem is to argue and make sure you get your piece of the pie. And what I think what we're finding in the industry is that's not really the case, that there are, um, there are ways to work together and collaborate, bring all the parties owner to designers to contractor to subcontractors to suppliers together and collaborate to avoid problems. Um, so are there any other wrong beliefs out there that you can think of that that need to be highlighted? I sure can think of one that I suffered from, and that is that um, the reputation that we have as contractors is that we love change orders and we're greedy. And so that uh, we might have a $10,000 change order, but we want $17,000 because that's the ratio that, that's actually proven out there. To execute $10,000 worth of direct cost change orders, it costs you 17000 because you've had delays, because you've had to rearrange equipment, um, you've had to move people off onto another uh, task, activity, and then move them back again. And you have to document all this to protect yourself and to try to get paid. But uh, I think a limiting belief is that contractors are greedy and don't want to collaborate. Uh, I, I find the opposite. Yeah, yeah, and that's um, you know to the I've worked with a lot of people who just uh, they just assume things to be true. They have this. Um, it's not really a value, but it's it's just the way they do business. For example, uh, I worked with some guys, and in their mind, renting equipment was always bad. Subcontracting was always bad. They didn't know why, <laughs> and they couldn't pencil it out, but they just knew. For example, instead of renting a track hoe for a week and spending $5,000, they would go out and buy a $40,000 track hoe because it's better to spend forty thousand dollars of cash on something that you need two weeks out of the year, than to rent something for five thousand dollars and use your money for something else that you do need. Which, so it, the notion, if if you're listening to this, if you can hear this, and if you're thinking all change orders are good, then that's not true. There are some change orders that are good for you, but um, if you look at it from the project standpoint, you know, total project, client, the whole team together, change orders generally are not good. They, they lead to long-term disputes, uh, delays, uh, distrust, and, and cause lots of problems. Um, so let's get back to BIM. Um, for those that, that aren't familiar, BIM stands for what? Building Information Modeling. And uh, 
some people call it uh, virtual design and construction to embrace the infrastructure components that are not not buildings. Uh, so virtual design and construction is the the other term. Okay. And um, so one of the things that that uh, we talked about before before the the interview is that there are proven metrics that demonstrate the value of BIM and maybe in more general terms modeling. Can you talk about what what's the ROI, what's the, the payback, and some of the, the metrics that, that you've seen to make uh, BIM and other forms of modeling a good investment? Yeah, let me talk about, um, first of all, uh, kind of the macro metrics. Uh, the the UK government is um, enjoying financial benefits, savings to the tune of uh, 5% of the total contract package. So they've moved to BIM, they've mandated BIM, and they're um, enjoying 5% savings, and, um, and that's net savings. So they acknowledge that creating a model and the design process can, t can cost up to 1% more than doing it in 2D, and they get 6% back for a net of 5%. So that's, A, it's the owner. Uh, so there are other savings that can be had when you move to BIM. The savings in, uh, that go to the construction manager, the subcontractor, and the designers. If we dig deeper into what, um, wh where does that money come from? Where does, how do you save five million on every hundred million that you spend uh, in the UK or anywhere else? Um, the, the towering savings is in change orders. The causal, the biggest cause of those change orders uh, and the opportunity for them uh, is to find those errors and omissions and eliminate them right at the outset. Uh, eliminate them entirely so they don't surface or find them, solve them as early as possible in the quickest, um, most expedient way. So the change order metric that's out there that's come from a number of sources, uh, Stanford University, Arizona, um, Carnegie Mellon, but the uh, change orders are going down between 37 and 55 percent. So that's in the literature that change orders, which is the, the biggest um, uh, financial, substantial, and tangible difference between the old two-dimensional environment and the model-based environment, change orders go down. You also save money. Uh, errors and omissions go down by one third to a half. Uh, so that's the root cause of savings, but not the big money savings. You also save money in uh, requests for information, just having a team. Instead of managing the job, they're correcting the geometry um, that, that is that appears on a, on a set of documents. Schedule is, is being accelerated between 5 and 25%. 25 is very high. I think we're seeing 7 to 12% um, is, is about what, what on average you can save of the total duration, design and construction duration. Prefabrication is another one. It's kind of hard to uh, just point to a single metric, but um, Southland Industries in, uh, on the West Coast has got some very uh, worthwhile reading and presentations on savings because they're moving things into prefabrication where you can save at least 40% on labor if you can figure out a way to take it into the shop what would otherwise be assembled in the field. Yeah, so that, let's that's talk about the metrics. Oh, that's great. Um, 
I had read an article recently, and I can't remember who it was, but a company's approach to prefab was, we're going to prefab everything possible. The only thing we're going to do in the job are scopes of work that we have proven or that we've demonstrated that we can't prefab in the shop. So do you have a couple of examples of, of things that you've seen contractors prefabbing that maybe you, you didn't see in the years past? Well, I never saw uh, multi-trade prefabrication. Skanska Shook has a great story on the Miami Valley healthcare facility. Um, they they put racks together in a shop with multiple trades, uh, 18 feet by 30 feet. This great video, um, uh, if you can find that, that's just a. I think that that's one of the very exciting things I've seen um, because it's multi-trade. It certainly requires a lot of planning but that's where the uh, that's where you get the big efficiencies on savings in um, labor um, it's a safer environment the quality goes up um, so I've also seen big pipe going in for a hospital project in Boston um, and you know just just like you've said, everything that you can possibly move into the shop just turns out better. You've got this great equipment. Um, it's a cleaner environment. You've got fans to remove the fumes. Um, so th that's that's something that I think we're we're seeing more and more of Southland Industries is really doing some amazing things too. Yeah, I worked on a, a high-rise project a few years ago, and it was a um, multi-dwelling unit, uh, senior living community. So there were about 250 units and it was all, it was concrete frame, metal stud, uh, construction, and uh, the electricians prefabbed all of their, uh, all of the wiring in the units. So they had used uh, MC cable and they had, they didn't use any wire nuts. Everything was push in connectors. Mm -hmm. So they had a whip with a box with push-in connectors in it, and they set a, a box inside that unit with every, every, everything they needed. It was all prefab in the shop, and something I've seen recently on um, uh, some office buildings that, that I've been involved in are the, the plumbers prefabbing the restrooms, yeah. building a metal angle, steel angle frame, uh, welding the carriers up, and literally the vent piping the waste piping, all the domestic hot and water, hot and cold water is all prefabbed and they roll it into place and with a few no-hub connections, they tie the vent pipe in and, the, and on the upstream and the, the waste pipe on the downstream, solder up the joints and it's ready to go and it's several days worth of work in, in the field and it's all done beforehand all done. They, they wheel it well, in. While the, while the steel is going up and it's freezing cold out, they're just yeah. going to get in a shop and, and accelerating the project. Yeah, and better that's quality. Twenty-five percent. When, when I've seen in the literature, really huge numbers of acceleration. It's because things were moved into the shop and running parallel with those outside um, big steel activities. Well, let me ask you this. this: This seems like a big opportunity, and this is a paradigm shift for people. You know. 50 years ago, nobody prefabbed roof trusses on, on homes. It was all stick framed. Mm -hmm. Well, nowadays, if it, especially if it's a complicated roof, you're hard pressed to find framers that, that can build a, a hip roof um, stick framing. So if, let's say a, a contractor brought you in and said, Ken, I need you for one day. I want to pay you to be a consultant. I need you to help me figure out what I can prefab. Like, where would you, what would be your thought process? What what would be your your framework? Where where would you start? What would the what would be the questions you would ask? Well, certainly the the biggest one is um, how much input to the design can you have? How early do you come in? If you're if you're letting a designer work for a couple of months or six months or eight months, and they come to you with a, a finished design, you're supposed to hard bid it. Um, you've just lost enormous opportunity because now you have to undo all the design so the first question is how much what do you have for um, input into the design process can you communicate with the designer 
do they do they listen do they have flexibility and then does the owner really understand like if the um uh, if we can possibly prefabricate what's the value of an extra month or an extra two months so certainly on the uh, high tech projects where you're or a hotel where you're opening and you can see revenue that the day that you can open and a month means an enormous difference financially so now we can really we can take the time to um, evaluate uh, another question is what kind of uh, what kind of cooperation between trades can we do can we only prefabricate within one trade or is there some way to um, bring assemblies to bring modular pieces that are actually involve multiple trades to the table so those are some of the questions that I would ask yeah that, that's good advice um, so for you folks listening I would I would suggest no matter what you do whatever business you're in look to prefab as much as possible think about what what can you prefab? It, it should be your go-to move instead of your go-to move being to build it in the field. Um, well, I know we're running short on time, Ken. One thing I want to talk about is uh, you're, you had the opportunity to work at Disney. So can you tell us a little bit about what you did there and maybe some of if you've got a, a story or of a project or something interesting you could share with us from your tenure at Disney? Well, I have a lot of stories. It was uh, probably the, the most amazing thing about working for Disney is just the level of the uh, complexity and the quality of the people that I was working with, the leadership. Uh, project management was, was really thought of as a science, and they, I think they hired some of the best project managers in the world. Um, the, one of the stories that may relate to the topics we've discussed is um, I was working as a lead project planner for Euro Disney. I was in Paris or at, uh, outside of Paris. With, um, there were five languages. We had subcontractors, specialty contractors from uh, five different countries. And so <laughs> trying to explain things as project manager or project planner uh, it was really tough to build cohesion, and so I made these three-dimensional um, sketches, built them up with the, the dates. So I built a three-dimensional uh, series of images that translated the schedule, the critical path method schedule, into very visual and universally understood across these five languages. Uh, so that was for a theater, and six months after I got back to uh, California and I was back at work on another project, I was still receiving um, notes and, and thank yous saying, thank you for helping us. We're still, everybody is still talking about that product that you made that, that conveyed the schedule. So it was a three-dimensional visual of the schedule. Yes, it was a series of three-dimensional images, and the completion dates for each of the objects, if you will, of the trades, the footing, the wall, the steel, the uh, flooring, everything was shown in this visual. Uh, I got you. The dates that they were to be finished. Interesting. I've, I've never heard of anything like that, but that makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, much more intuitive than a Gantt chart, I'm sure. Well, in some ways, I think, you know, we're just, we as an industry, we're becoming much better communicators. Uh, we, that was a better way to convey the schedule than a bar chart. And everybody talked about it, everybody loved it, and it brought us together as a multicultural multi-trade team so uh, the same thing is happening with design two-dimensional blueprints are really good for certain activities but they are not a great vehicle for communication so they're not a great vehicle to get buy-in to communicate with the users the owner 
uh, the people that are bidding it, the people that are going to um, operate it, and the people that uh, have to build it. So we're becoming great communicators, and technology is helping us. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting point. Um, Two-dimensional drawings are not great for communication. They were 30, 40, 50 years ago, they were very helpful for bidding a project if it was all about assigning risk and uh, dividing up the pie appropriately. But yeah, in this day and age, um, it's, a different, it's a different way of doing business. So that's a really good point. Two-dimensional drawings are not, not great for communication. Yeah, I know there's been several times when I've been standing in front of a set of drawings explaining something to either an owner or a subcontractor and they're shaking their head up and down, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, nodding, but I know they don't, they don't know what I'm talking about. So they, your they don't get it. change orders when they finally see what it looks like. Yeah, yeah, and you're like, okay, so this is what your lobby's going to look like, Mr. CEO. This wall's two stories, accent colors here and railing here, and it's like there is a, a social experiment I've heard of where it's called the tapping experiment, where if you and I were on the other side of the table, I would I would tap a song on my my desk, and you know I hear the song in my head, and it's very obvious to me. And your job would be to guess the song. Well, all you hear is you don't hear the pitch, you don't have the any of the background, and you're like I, I have no idea. Is it Happy Birthday? Is it Beethoven? What? And you have no idea, but. On my side, I can't believe that you can't you can't hear the song that's in my head, and that happens so many times in project meetings where I know you're getting what I'm saying, but they just they don't get it. And you're exactly right. We've we've got to be better communicators, and that's probably at the root of a lot of the the disputes is communication, just the poor communication. Hmm. Well, I, I know we're we're running out of time. One thing I want to talk about is for the the folks who are in a small to medium sized business, you know, and maybe they're not in a position to make a big investment just yet, and they, they want to, but they, they see the value in modeling and uh, collaboration and, and increasing their efficiency, prefabrication, et cetera. What are some kind of what are some key principles that folks can? grab onto and implement in their business. For example, you know, we said prefabrication. You need to look at everything you could possibly prefabricate. So maybe it's that's a principle. Another principle might be communicate better. Are there any other kind of overarching principles that people should embrace to uh, to move their business forward? Well, I think there are different businesses that are going to uh, derive different points of value. So one of them may be just plain speed. The, the notion that you can finish a month or two faster, that may be the driving thing. It may be quality because when you bring it into the shop and prefabricate, it's finally quality that, that your owner really cares about. Um, so my recommendation is to actually study, um, I call them 19 benefits of BIM. There are 19 possible ones. There's benefits in the field is, of course, the, the, what I call the dominoes of waste, errors and omissions, requests for information, change orders, delays, prefabrication, um, acceleration. Those, all those painful areas of waste, just being a little bit um, introspective as a, as a company culture and say, where, where is the possible waste that we can eliminate and that them is proven to help us, and then you you buy the product, buy the uh, get the training that you need to pursue a target. And my recommendation is to actually um, set some performance targets. So if you're um, if you're running a CM at risk type of project, and you'll be rewarded and appreciated if you eliminate change orders. Um, that might be the, the big one. It might be schedule, as I mentioned. Um, but set some targets for um, higher performance. And don't call it a, a BIM initiative. Don't call it a technology initiative. I'm encouraging executives to call it a performance initiative. And that explains why 
I'm investing in BIM even though it costs me money because I get a return on that investment. Right. And BIM, just like lean planner or just like uh, a shovel, it's a tool and it's it's a way to do something. Um, so BIM is a way to to eliminate waste, to flush out changes, to speed up projects, improve productivity, uh, lots of good things. So that's um, that that's good advice. One one last question. I want to go back to your your tenure at Disney. You had the rare opportunity to work with, as you said, some of the, the finest project managers in the world. What are some some things? Let's talk to the project managers uh, listening right now. What are some things that you saw Disney project managers doing that every construction project manager listening needs to do? Well, let's see. Uh, one of the things that was Disney in transition, actually. We, we saw Disney moving from um, single projects working in silos that all added up to a, a portfolio of park and it was it was a big project it was uh 1.4 billion dollars um what we saw f for thinking and planning um was a reinvention of how all these projects are all merged together it became one one big uh source of data and when we merged them like that we we saw amazing efficiencies just materialize we saw we um we used to spend hours and hours trying to integrate project schedules because we had them in different databases well all of a sudden we had one master project schedule and we could filter out, and we knew where the conflicts would be. We could do a resource analysis. So that that's a big picture, a, a big project example of thinking of this data as being a source of real power. So we also involved operations and maintenance in the planning process during design because the operations and maintenance of a Disney park is just uh, really expensive <laughs> and having any any of the uh, rides or theaters down for any kind of maintenance because you go down is a real problem so involving people uh, in the beginning in the design process and also keeping in mind that the geometry and the data that you put into the model and design process is very powerful in construction but the big money surfacing now in the research and in my experience the big money is in operations and maintenance where they use the uh, the data uh, and mo mobile mobile technology to make uh, every work order faster all, all kinds of efficiencies show up in operations and maintenance, and that was something that Disney recognized early on. That's that, that's very interesting, and that's very um, very true. As far as uh, construction folks tend to put our we tend to put our heads down and ignore the operations and maintenance of a building. But I heard a statistic recently that. Um, Initial construction cost can be somewhere in the neighborhood of 20% of lifetime operating cost or lifetime cost of a facility, including operations and maintenance. So, building owners would be wise to um, to get operations and maintenance folks involved on the front end when there's capital available. It seems like once a building is done, then there's hardly any capital available for for rework or modifications. That's that's been my experience. Um, so let me go back to how do we bounce back and forth. You mentioned the, the dominoes of waste. Is there a place folks can go if they want to find out more about those 19, I think there were 19 um, areas of waste or dominoes of waste? Well, there's 19 benefits of BIM on my list. And, okay. Uh, that can be found on slides that are available on the web. Um, the dominoes of waste is um, 
12 uh, categories of waste, one topples onto another. So the error and omission, request for information, change order, delay, uh, limited prefab because everything's changing, um, uh, s schedule, uh, quality, overtime. So those those all just stack up. So recognizing those uh, is really good idea. The, a lot of the training, if, if you will, the, um, the the background that I've gotten from waste, being kind of a waste analyst and a promoter of lean, is from Lowry Kaskila. He said it sounds like a woman's name, but it's L A U R I. He is a very brilliant um, researcher in the UK, and he wrote the most powerful uh, document I think that's been produced in the last 25 years on waste and the opportunity for lean. If you want to read about lean and BIM, Lowry Koskila had uh, put out a paper with Raphael Sachs, S A C K S, and that um, takes a look at. Waste as a problem and lean thinking combined with BIM technology as a powerful uh, solution in combination. Uh, the other point of reference, I think one of the great papers of the decade, is Douglas Chelson. And when he graduated from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, I believe, Douglas Chelson. C-H-E-L-S-O-N. It's one of my favorite um, research papers of all time. Excellent. Well, um, I'll probably ask for, I'll, I'll get some links put together for these resources and put on the on the show notes for this call. For those of you who are interested in that, I'll, I'll get that from you uh, after the call, Ken. Um, so, uh, really appreciate this information. This has been great. Um, I appreciate you making the time for this. If well, first of all, before I give you an opportunity to share where people might find out more about you or get in touch with you, is there anything else that uh, you want to share with the group before we wrap up? No, just that I've I've enjoyed this a lot. I I feel like uh, uh, I am trying not to sound like somebody who says technology is is. The be all and end all. It's it's not. We the the technology is a tool, and uh, I think it's a tough it's a tough decision as to how to create a company strategy. But I am absolutely convinced that it's a really good time to make sure that you're getting better and better, and investigating um, lean principles, lean thinking, doing a self evaluation, a company evaluation of where the waste is and, and where your future profits are going to be. Well, in the, the words of a gentleman named Martin Fister, he was my first boss, one of the smartest guys I ever worked for, he said, good tools are always a good investment. They always pay for themselves. So <laughs> if, if it's a good tool, then um, then it will make money for you and you will not regret the investment. It's, it's not a cost, it's an investment. So, um, well, Ken, where can people connect with you? Um, I don't think we've even talked about where you're at right now. So you, uh, you want to share a little bit about uh, where you work now and is there, are you on social media or if people want to email you or get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, I have an email address, which is ken.stow at autodesk.com. I... Um I have I am on LinkedIn. Uh, I can there's a, some videos online of the workshop that looks at return on inf uh, re return on investment, uh, investing in BIM as a project and, and evaluating the 19 benefits of BIM, selecting the ones that are most effective for um, your project or your portfolio. Um, I guess that I can probably uh, I can be found in a lot of places. Autodesk University I've presented a number of times over the years, and so those presentations are um, available uh, online as well. 
Perfect. Well, I'll uh, I'll get those links put together, put them on the the notes for this call, so folks can watch the videos and and connect with you on LinkedIn. I'll put your email address there, and um, yeah, if um, so, if people have questions, I assume it's okay to get in touch with you. Yes. Excellent. Well, Ken, again, great stuff. I appreciate you doing this, and um, thanks for being on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me, Todd. It seems like a, a great vehicle for your audience. Well, that wraps up this episode. Make sure and go to constructionleadingedge.com forward slash 041 to get the notes for this call to find the links and the other things, the other resources that Mr. Ken Stowe shared. Be sure to go to constructionleadingedge.com forward slash mistakes to download a copy of the 41 mistakes to avoid when dealing with conflict. And I will see you next time. Thanks for listening.